Good morning. Welcome to Heritage Church. My name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here. This is Pastor Suzanne over here. We are so glad you're here for Easter morning. Um, if you don't mind, before we get started on this message, if you pull out this announcement sheet, you were handed at the door. Come on, show it to You can do it. All right, now grab your hand right in front of you. Start filling out the in part with the connect card. Put your name, name of the family members that are here with you today, email, just information you're comfortable sharing. You won't misuse it. We'll send you a little information about what happens here at Heritage Church. If you ever want off the list, just click unsubscribe. No harm, no foul. We'd just love to send you a little information and hear from you. If you're our guests here this morning, we welcome you. We know that you have many choices and places to worship. So it's a guest. It's our gift to have you here as our guest. We do have a small uh, gift to give to you today. You can get it on your way out your door. We'll be standing by the door as you exit on your right. Just stop by and introduce yourself. Let's have a moment to say hello. And we are so glad that you've chosen to worship with us at Heritage Church hey, this hey, morning. before we get started, can we get a selfie? Oh, we want y'all want to get a selfie? Yes. Yeah, we got to get a selfie. Hey, turn the house lights up a little Turn bit. up. Are you ready? Are you yeah, ready? we're going to okay. get it with them. Hold on. Right, Hold on. You ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? On, on, on three? We're going to have to do one side at a time because you're all so big. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're good. Okay. All right. All right. Ready Look, to go say? All right. Ah. Say happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. This is ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> happy Easter, everyone. Sorry. So we we have been talking about the importance of neighbors and how important it is for us to love our neighbors. And this morning, we uh, again, we're given a reminder. Every time we turn on the news, it feels like, you know, our world is in desperate need of learning how to love one another. Can I get an amen on that? And so this morning, we uh, pray for the people in Sri Lanka and the bombings that occurred as people gathered just to simply come to a place to worship. And so let's just stop for a second and lift a prayer up for them. I think it would be disrespectful to their pain to not stop and pause for a minute for what happened in Sri, Sri Lanka this Easter morning. Jesus, your word says you are close to the brokenhearted. May those people feel the power, your resurrection power, in the midst of their deep pain. Amen. So in talking about our neighbors, we've kind of used that age-old question that Mr. Rogers used. Could you be mine? Would you be mine? Say it with me. Won't you be my neighbor? And Mr. Rogers, being the iconic man that he was, um, he had this quote, and it's so powerful. He said that loving your neighbor is one of the most sacred things that we can do. And that word sacred means one of the most holy things we can do is to simply love our neighbor. And so as we think about this concept of loving our neighbor, we have to remember that if we say we love God, we must love our neighbors. You know, Mr. Rogers didn't pull this out of thin air. He kind of knew Jesus. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was a pastor. And his ministry was through the TV to young people. But he understood the command of Jesus. One, one time, religious experts stopped Jesus, and they tried to, they tried to test him all the time, and they asked him, what is the greatest commandment? And so Jesus gave it to him. He said, he replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And he said, that's amazing. And he kept talking. He said, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. All your religion, unless it hangs on these, is worthless. And in his language, in that time when he put those two commandments together, the language he used bound them together and they're inextricable. They cannot come apart. One depends upon the other. In fact, one of Jesus' followers would go on to say that if you say you love God, and there's a lot of us that love God, but you hate your brother or sister, then you're a liar. You can't have one without the other. If you're going to love God, then you have to love your neighbor. And so this morning we gather to celebrate the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I have good news for everyone here. Did you know this? You are loved. Let me say it again. You are loved. God loves you. No matter how far you've wandered, no matter how low you've sunk, there is a God that went to extraordinary measures to be able to be in a relationship with you. And for that, we give thanks this morning that our God wants to be in a relationship with us. You know, in Scripture, there's a, there's a man named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, he's, he, he believes in Jesus, and he goes to Jesus, and he's kind of asking Jesus, what is your mission? You know, why are you here? And, and Jesus shares the good news with him, but that good news is news 
that's lived out in our lives every day. We experience the good news when we understand that Jesus was born, God came down to heaven, walked in earthly form so that he could relate to us and so he could bring us into relationship with him. We understand that by his ministry. Jesus walked this earth for three years and, and through his ministry, what we hear, the overwhelming message Jesus says over and over again is love, love one another, love. We see it in his death that if we're going to love our neighbors, we have to be willing sometimes to sacrifice. And then we see it through the power of the resurrection. No matter how low we can go as humans, God offers us this new life. So Nicodemus, he believes in Jesus, and he goes to Jesus, and he's kind of talking to him, and he sort of asks Jesus, Jesus, you know, what are you here for? You know, kind of, what is, what is your mission? And this morning we're going to look at the scripture from the Gospel of John and what Jesus had to say about why he came. So Jesus says this in John 3, The Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. If Jesus had that mission and Jesus has been resurrected and Jesus is in heaven, now Jesus has given us the job of continuing his mission. And our job is to lift up the good news, to lift up the power of the resurrection. But unfortunately, in a lot of situations, we've turned the good news into bad news. Because we've decided who the recipients of the good news are. And maybe as you wandered in, you saw our signs that we have here. But let's think about who is the good news for? For God so loved the what? World. So we're called to love our neighbors. Our neighbors who don't look like us. Our neighbors who don't think like us. Our neighbors who don't speak like us. Our neighbors who don't love like us. Our neighbors who don't believe like us. Our neighbors who don't vote like us. Our neighbors who don't act like us. For God so loved the world. And if we want to love our neighbors, we have to understand the power of the good news. You know, I mean, part of the good news that I think we don't get that kind of turns it into bad news is we don't understand his full mission. And there's things that, that we do that turn the good news into bad news. And there's a couple things that stand in the way of people hearing it. And the first one's condemnation. And religious people, oh God, we're so good at that. We're so good at condemning people. Like it's our job. It's not even a pay grade. Right? And we're so good at it. And the world doesn't need us to condemn it. It feels condemned every day. Just post something slightly controversial on your social media and watch what happens. You'll be condemned. Right? We feel condemned every day. We walk around in condemnation every day. And the church ought to be the safest place in the world for a person to walk into all week long, you ought to walk in here and feel none of that. None of that. And Jesus would agree. He said, God did not send His Son. This is after 3.16 that we've all memorized. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This in itself is just a statement of faith. We walk through this world not understanding what God is about. We walk through this world feeling like God is ready, so ready to condemn us. We walk condemned already. And we don't believe in the name of God's one and only Son. Do you know what the name Jesus means? In its original language, you know what Yeshua is? It means God saves. He even named His Son after His mission. <laughs> And when we don't understand that God is saving us, then we walk around in this condemned mode and then we condemn everybody else. That's why the world is the way it is. Because we haven't believed that God so loved. But why would we? When we feel condemned by God's children, why would we understand because that condemnation Jesus told us not to do this Jesus said don't even get close to this don't even judge people lest you want to be judged don't judge me don't even get close to condemnation don't even go there it's not your job 
you're not good at it. And I don't want you to anyway. Because judgment and condemnation blocks love. It blocks our love. It blocks for God so love. Where people cannot see you. If we're going to love our neighbors, then we have to understand that the good news has no condemnation. You know, there's a byproduct of condemnation. We've all felt condemned from time to time, and the byproduct of condemnation is shame. And shame is something that is overwhelming, affecting so many people in the world around us. We've all felt shame for one thing or another. It is the most heartbreaking emotion that you can feel. It's one where you internalize the bad things we've done. We've all know, know that we've fallen short. We've fallen short in our relationships. We've fallen short, as Scripture says, in the glory of God, we have fallen short. But shame doesn't say, I did a bad thing. Shame internalizes it and says, I am bad. But you know, Jesus... Jesus refused to condemn people. And Jesus refused to condemn people because I believe that Jesus knew the effects of shame. Jesus knew that shame shatters relationships. Jesus knew that when we feel ashamed of who we are, that we are unable to love the way God called us to love. Shame blocks love. And we walk around so much, even on this Easter Monday morning, there are some of us sitting here, and we are stuck in our shame. And Jesus says these words. He says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love the darkness instead of light. You see, when we remain stuck in shame, we're remaining, choosing to remain stuck in darkness because their deeds were evil. We do the wrong things. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. And isn't that the thing we fear the most? Don't we fear that our insides might actually come out on the outside? And if that were to happen, that we would be rejected? It's in our DNA. I mean, think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They had everything. And then they chose to sin. And what's the first thing they did when they sinned? The scripture says that they hid. We want to hide, but our God, through the power of the resurrection, tells us we don't have to hide anymore. We can come to God with our hurts and our wounds and our pain and our shame, and our God heals us, resurrects us, and gives us a new life. We do not have to live our lives stuck in shame. That's the power of the resurrection. You have a new life. Walk in it. That sacrifice that Jesus made on that cross, cross, the power of the resurrection, it covers everything. Do you hear me? Everything. God covers our shame. Don't stay there. He walked out of the grave. Let's walk out too. And if we're going to love our neighbors, we have to understand that the good news covers everyone's shame. <coughs> supposed to be good news. And yet, people aren't hearing it for some reason. <coughs> good morning. I mean, you can't blame everybody, but there's a few. It's religious people condemning me and shaming me. And that's sad enough as it is, is something that blocks the good news, but it, it betrays a deeper truth. That we don't fully really believe the good news ourselves. We don't really, really understand how it applies to us. That we are still walking around in condemnation and shame. And so to hide it, we'll come to Jesus, we'll accept that grace, but then we put on a show. We figured I could just fake it till I make it, but we know darn well on the inside what's going on, don't we? And we haven't fully walked into God's love because we don't fully trust it. And this is what Jesus says, whoever lives by the truth comes into the life. So that it may be seen plainly what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Are you afraid to stand in that light, followers of Jesus? 
can you not just be you for all your worth, warts and all, and understand that God loves you and that God covers your shame and that God's son refuses to condemn you because that's what the world needs to see from us. They need to see believers free. Free to walk in the sight of God without condemnation, without shame. They need to see us free. And when they see us free, they will understand the gospel. You barely have to say a word. They'll just want what you have. They'll want the good news for themselves. If we're going to share the good news, then we have to believe it ourselves.